Hello, Vinny. Well, good to be with you today and uh, Happy New Year. Um, I think we have uh, known each other, what, now coming on 20 years. And, wow. Uh, yeah. Happy Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully for another 20. So uh, I'm here with Dave Wagner, or we're both from Avasan, Avasan Research, and uh, we're here to talk to you about generative AI and uh, a benchmarking study that we did recently. Uh, you've been asking us to come on for some time now, but we've po finally published the study, so we thought this would be a good time uh, to give you a look and, uh, and your audience and uh, hopefully have some good discussion here. Uh, Dave, you want to just say hello? Yeah, hi, Vinny. Uh, thanks for having me. Happy New Year. I, I think... The, I, I think the last time, if memory serves, that I saw you, we were having a passionate discussion about AI and the job market and what it would do uh, probably about five years ago. It was pre-COVID <laughs> uh, in the back of a shuttle uh, at a conference. I can't remember which conference it was, uh, but it was, a, it was a very stimulating conversation. So I'm looking forward to continuing that conversation all these years later. Well, Frank and Dave, great to have you. Happy New Year to both of you. And, you know, Dave, that was probably after my book called Silicon Collar, which is about automation and the impact on the job market and so on. So this is this is a, a new wave of automation. I've had several guests in the last year talk about generative AI, economics, use cases, et cetera. But this is a, you know, fact-based research uh, study, Frank, one of the first that I think in the market. So looking forward to it. Well, very good. So let's get started. Um, many of your audience members uh, know me and know Dave from uh, the research firm Computer Economics. If you hadn't heard the news, um, Computer Economics was acquired by Avasan uh, in 2020. Avasan is a, a global a management consulting firm, um, had its own research practice um, as well. And now we're part of Avasan Research and, and very happy uh, to be part of it. And now, as being part of a larger organization, we actually have more resources uh, to dedicate to our uh, research. And Avasan has been uh, very supportive, uh, encouraging us to extend our research coverage. Um, as many of you know, we have covered um, IT spending and staffing uh, benchmarks uh, for a number of years. We expanded that now into Europe um, back in 2020. Um, also some other new research. And then uh, this year, uh, we had strong encouragement to do a similar benchmarking study on generative AI. So that's what uh, this is about uh, this uh, today, this morning, uh, where we are. Um, so we're going to give you um, a, a recap of that, a summary. Uh, we just published this uh, in January. Uh, there is a free executive summary. You can go to the Avasant Research uh, website and uh, download the free executive summary. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, to give you uh, the highlights of that uh, now this morning. So I'm going to kick it off to Dave. Let uh, Dave drive drive this here. I'll chime in with some uh, some ideas and some feedback as well. So Dave, uh, go right ahead. Yeah, Frank, we'll put a link to the download. We'll give you the link. Yeah, good. In, in this, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, so really, uh, as you know, Frank, the idea behind the study was we. You know, for about a year or so, Gen AI has been the hot topic that everybody's talking about. Every conference you go to, every uh, C-suite discussion you have, one, it, it's only a matter of moments before Gen AI will come up in the conversation. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of organization around the topic. Uh, whenever you go to one of these things, uh, a lot of times people are talking about what they're doing with it or what someone else is doing with it. But uh, there, there really hasn't been, in, in our opinion, a very good gathering of data around who's doing it, who's governing it, who's paying for it, and what are they doing with it once they've adopted it. And then how much are they, how much are they spending on it? And how much are they, they're spending on it. And, um, and so uh, we really wanted to... Uh, to put some data around this and help people uh, kind of clarify um, how they should be thinking about adopting generative AI in their enterprise and, um, and what some folks are doing. So what we did is we reached out to about 200 companies that are early adopters in Gen AI. All 200 of these companies have adopted some generative AI. 
And that's important to note as when we're going through all of this data here, because these are folks who have a, have a clear understanding, a clear purpose of what they wanted to do with Gen AI. Some studies we've seen are showing, you know, 10 to 20% adoption in this area. So uh, it's important to know these are the front runners. These are the guys in the bleeding edge. Um, and because yeah, and you have a breakdown by industry. Yeah, and we're and we're going to break it out. And we have broken it out by uh, eight different industries: uh, retail, BFSI, healthcare, professional services, okay. uh, uh, IT services and solution, uh, as well as a, a composite. Um, and so uh, it's important to. to the that. reason I the reason I ask yeah. quite often. When you look at new te new technology phenomenon, the high tech industry tends to be an early adopter. I think with Gen AI, it's been it's been a little more a little more broad based. So it'd be interesting to see your your right. data. I, yeah. I agree. It is more broad based, and it, but also one of the things that I think is important with Gen AI is that Gen AI isn't one thing. Uh, right. It's it, it's a, a way to deploy thousands and millions of things. And, and because of that, uh, what Gen AI looks like in banking versus healthcare is very different. Um, not just the money or the or the governance, but the actual use cases. So you know, that's that's been the the big aha from last year was how many vendors are trying to sell horizontal <clears throat> Gen AI, right? HR, finance, very few operational industry specific. Gen AI examples. So again, it'll be interesting to get your perspective there. Yeah, and every chapter we did, uh, we put in different. We went, we put in industry specific use cases, so that if you're reading that chapter, you're going, you're not just going to see a generic company X is doing this. It will be a healthcare company is doing this, so that you can really understand the art of the possible. Um, so uh, Frank's uh, switched the slide uh, here to the first question. And obviously, you know, when you start with a question like this, uh, you're not going to expect uh, a group of, of, of early adopters to say that Gen AI isn't strategically important. Nonetheless, we put this chart here because I wanted to emphasize uh, the 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 high level of strategic importance Gen AI is being shown. We we ask this question routinely of all sorts of technologies. And we never get this kind of level of right. uh, very strategic companies. I mean, as you can see, this one uh, retailer director level said so it it is the future, uh, and I think it's important to to realize this isn't going away. We're not at the top of a hype cycle where we're going to start seeing a decline. Uh, we're actually just starting to see the, the beginning of, of adoption. Frank, do you want to add anything to this? I mean, the slide itself is pretty pretty mundane, but I think it 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 shows where we're headed and and where Gen AI is. Well, at. well, all the vendors and the service providers are declaring this is really the most important thing that's going on right now in the tech industry. I think what this slide tells us is that, you know, buyers um, yeah. feel that way as well. Now, buyers may not be as far as long as the vendors and the service providers are in terms of uh, implementation and, and uh, developing products, but, but I would say they're following, uh, uh, following uh, close behind. Um, let me tease up the I next. Wrote a, I wrote a yeah. note last week about three big industry industry macro uh, events: CES, NRF, which is a retail specific one, and WEF, which is in Davos. And in every one of them, the big headlines are Gen AI, right? And part of my worry is a lot of the use cases are very, very horizontal, very, very you know, this can work everywhere. So I think that's where there's a slight difference between what vendors are pushing versus what customers will end up adopting, at least my view. So that's right. We'll be hearing more. Well, I, I think what you're going to see right now, uh, well, what you have right now is a lot of um, individual use cases bubbling up. Uh, and what's going to happen, I think, is vendors are going to start capturing these good use cases and implementing them into their software, whether it's an ERP, a CRM, uh, supply chain management software, whatever it is, they're gonna start 
pulling these in um, and and when when they when they bubble up, they'll be able to be put in modules uh, and other ways to verticalize them. But you're right at the start when you're thinking about vendors, they're they're going to be looking at it from a, a wide range because they're trying to capture as much of the market as they can. One of okay. my one of my guests made a great comment. He said, "You know, they we keep focusing on SGNA. We try to optimize SGNA. We're trying to do that with GNA also. When in fact we should be focused on cogs, cost of goods sold." Which obviously is very different from industry to industry, right? Right. And my my response was, was we need to look at the whole PNL. Why are we stopping at just the cost side? We well, we're gonna we're this. we're at, we actually have a slide on that in just a minute, Vinny. So you're gonna and it's where it's gonna say exactly what you're saying here. So let's uh, let me move forward here. Um, let me tease this up here a little bit, uh, Dave. Uh, one of the things that we thought of, and we were actually encouraged to do this uh, by Avasan, was you know where are these projects being run? Are they being run in the IT department? Are they being run in sales? Or where is the governance of uh, these programs that are taking place, Dave? What did we find here? Yeah, I, I mean, for the most part, uh, they're very centralized. As you can see, they're 41% say they're centralized uh, or federated, at least within a, a couple of groups. Um, and that's important because it shows, and, and to see the next slide, it shows that the, it has real strategic value at the sea level. We're seeing who is pooling that data together. But it is driven by market. Um, you'll see, uh, interestingly enough, IT services solutions, these vendors we were talking about, Vinny, they're far more likely to have uh, federated models or decentralized models than, say, retail and healthcare that are trying very hard to do a, a top-down uh, effort with, with uh heavily centralized models uh, at the C-suite level. Um, and, oh, sorry. Sounds no, I'm just going to say, um, so we determined here that they tend to be highly centralized. On the next uh, finding, we said, okay, well, then where is it centralized, right? Yeah. And this is the key. I, I, I think this shows the real value of Gen AI to the strategic side, to the revenue side, as well as the uh, as the cost side, because it's being run overwhelmingly. Those companies that do have a centralized or federated model are, are putting that uh, authority in the hands of either the CEO, uh, or the, excuse me, the CIO, or the CEO and board of directors, uh, almost overwhelmingly. Um, you do have some teams, some cross-functional teams that are, are running this at a lower level. You see they're 14%. Um, but this is a high priority. This is not something just to be left to uh, shadow IT, the way we saw, right. say, the way cloud entered uh, the market. There's a very different uptake of this technology than the way uh, some a lot of uh, consumerization happened. Even though I do think chat GPT and some consumer grade uh, Gen AI may have kicked this off, enterprises were more ready to uh, accept this technology and pull it in uh, than they were for, say, the smartphone or the cloud or uh, in store, you know, uh, cloud storage and a lot of other things that were really consumer driven uh, in the 90s and the zeros. That's right. And again, you'll see, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you, we back just, and you're going to see retail and healthcare highly centralized. And I think that shows um, not only the importance of retail and healthcare, but the way retail and healthcare have to think about this because they are um, particularly healthcare uh, are kind of behind when it comes to uh, IT uptake, uh, technology uptake. So, the fact that healthcare is taking this seriously, I think they're hoping to leapfrog a lot of problems that they have with the complications they have in their IT departments at the moment. Dave, did you drill into IT? I'm hearing a lot of data-driven uh, strategies, right? So people are looking at value of data. Where would yeah. the best use cases happen? Where is our data not really organized, pretty dirty, and so on? Are you did did you go down to that level when you in the in those who said it is still an IT? 
we didn't ask questions around the data itself. We asked questions around use cases, but we saw a lot of healthcare companies who were looking at uh, adopting Gen AI as a way of uh, creating personalized medicine, uh, looking at uh, EHRs, uh, electronic health records, and um, and trying to tailor uh, conversations directly with patients. So, uh, you know, as an example, you're probably very familiar with is that the chronic disease management is a major cost in uh, the healthcare industry. It's over a trillion dollars, I believe, over the last 10 years in, in chronic health management problems. Rehospitalization is a huge issue with chronic disease like diabetes. A lot of that rehospitalization or chronic disease management problem comes from a lack of ability to communicate directly with the patient uh, in an effective manner. So one of the major use cases that we saw mentioned multiple times would be using uh, a, a generative AI to create essentially a, a buddy or a co-pilot, if, if you were, for uh, someone with a chronic disease to help them manage that. You know, I've had I have a, had a couple of really interesting conversations with C level executives where they go, "What is the data we would never share with any hyperscaler or any outside body?" Right. So if you're Coca Cola, you're not going to share your formula. It's been in a safe for the last hundred years. <laughs> They're not going to share it with anybody. Pharmaceutical companies are not going to share their molecular data with anybody. Right. And then right. they work downwards to say, "Okay, what's the value below what we wouldn't share?" And it typically is some operational, some customer facing, and they go down to administrative applications at the bottom. So it's kind of interesting to see how people are looking at, partly because they're saying, we may be able to monetize this. We're not going to let anybody else have access to it, right? Right, right. And, and later, we're actually going to cover uh, some of the fears of Gen AI. And one of the questions we actually asked about was, proprietary data loss and are we afraid of that as as we've seen we've had a couple of high uh profile uh data loss situations already where someone has put proprietary proprietary data inside a public llm and accidentally released that out to the world um so we did talk about some of those uh issues uh, and we'll talk about them here when, a little later uh in the survey Go ahead, Dave. So the next slide, we're talking about those business functions, and this is across the composite sample. This is not by industry. When you look by industry, you see the, sh the shift of these in different priorities. But Dave, what are some of the business functions that are really the high high uh, usage areas? Yeah, well, it's not a surprise. Software development is number one. Um, I think that's a um, couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first is we've seen uh, GitHub Copilot and some things. They've been around for a lot longer than some other generative AI. So uh, obviously that's something people are uh, a little more comfortable with. Uh, also, um, you, you've got the reality that software development is an extremely expensive uh, area. Um, the you know application developers, especially good application developers command large salaries. They're hard to find, uh, particularly for certain types of development. Uh, so it makes sense. Software development would be high up on the list. Uh, Dave, I can, I can, Dave, I can see that in IT services, right? Because that talent and the cost of talent is a big driver there. Did you see yeah. that in non-IT services? Yes, vertical? we did. Yeah. Yes. It Not was just... the most common function across almost every... Oh, sorry, sorry, Frank, go ahead. You were no, say. I was just going to say exactly what you're saying. It, you would think that it would be the tech industry would list software development, but even non-tech industries, like Dave said, most of them listed software development as a top use case. And I think because it does lend itself well to generative AI. Programming is a very structured, it's got syntax, you know, it's got formal rules of construction, and it just lends itself very well to uh, to automation, documentation, summarization, rationalization, all those Asians, right, uh, is very useful for that. Right. And, and you know, software ate the world a few years ago. So right. there isn't a, uh, a company that doesn't have some app development function. Um, and so it makes sense uh, that they would be there. Another one that makes sense is number two on the list, which is customer service. Uh, you know, even though we don't think about 
chat bots and, and as generative AI all the time. Uh, you know, some chat bots would qualify as generative AI. We saw a lot of companies who are building other types of personalized customer service. Sure. Um, and so that's- and I've a heard a couple of people say it's a dynamic FAQ generator, right? Rather right. than a static one, we can have it updated every day just about based on- Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, the you see there are some outliers here that I think are interesting. Uh, healthcare, interestingly enough, their most common use is HR. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why, to, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> that HR bubbled to the top there. I mean, obviously, health <clears throat> has a very complicated. I mean, I may have an answer. Every oh, year, we vendor, well, thank you. Yeah. Every, every year, we vendor, if you look at the early Gen AI use cases, has some employee HR. Ah. So it's a supply side driven phenomenon more than <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that that part I get. The fact that it bubbled up over software development, customer service surprised me. But but yeah, you're absolutely right. They have a complicated needs in, in terms of HR. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was a little surprised by is that sales is at the bottom of this list. Right. Uh, we've seen you know Salesforce and other companies. Do at least some limited forms of Gen AI and, and sales teams recommendations for a long time now. Um, so it's a little surprising this was low. I'm wondering, we've, we've noticed a phenomenon with AI a lot in our research for, for almost a decade. We, we see sometimes uh, things that are accepted as normal parts of software. Uh, companies sometimes forget to call it AI. They just right. think it's kind of baked in. Um, so we think sometimes our responders uh, forget that they're using AI and some, uh, not forget, but don't, when they're doing a survey, don't think to include something because they're thinking about the hot new fangled AI they're using. A, one of the things that's interesting about AI is the more ubiquitous it gets, the more it's a part of our lives, the less noticeable it becomes. Sure. Um, on the on the uh, people cost development code development, <clears throat> I've noticed an interesting phenomenon with IT services. When you ask them, they go, "Oh yeah, it's going to be one of our biggest practices." When you ask them, "What about your internal cost?" Boy, they they shut up pretty quick. <laughs> I mean, they don't want to share that. Yes, it's going to reduce our cost. They don't want. <laughs> They just don't want to go there. As if people are not going to push them on that. <laughs> right. They don't yeah. want to be responsible for that. Dave, what are some of the use cases specifically we saw from our survey respondents? Yeah, these are fun. I, I really enjoyed reading these. I, I mean, there were a lot that are that are are pretty, you know, common, pretty standard. As we talked about personalized uh, customer interactions, chatbots, code, code developers, things like that. But I, I, I highlighted these out here because I thought they were pretty interesting. Um, we saw two different companies who have already passed off their first round of interviews and assessments of re resumes and CVs to, to generative AI, to chat bots over their HR set. Um, I, I thought that seemed pretty brave, uh, right. honestly, to pass off that first round of interviews completely to a chat bot. Um, I, I feel like that round of interviews is sometimes where you really find the talent bubbling up that maybe it's not obvious on their resume, but they're really smart interviewers. Uh, so passing that off to a chat bot, I see why it saves money, uh, but but maybe it's a little, a little overly brave, to be honest, yeah. um, but very interesting. There was also, I, I thought this one was fascinating. Uh, there's a retailer, this, you know, the bulk of his sales, obviously retail, but it has a small business to business sales team. They were able to eliminate that team entirely and turn over their B2B sales entirely to a Gen AI, wow. um, which uh, is very impressive. Um, we didn't get a, a ton of details on how they did that. I'm assuming some sort of self-service uh, platform created with a chatbot to go with it. Um, 
a professional uh, services team uh, a fir firm replaced their entire procurement team with Gen AI. And um, entire, I assume entire, entire procurement? their entire procurement team. That's wow. what they said. Yep. In, it must be indirect procurement. I, I yeah, indirect. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and and the uh, and I am um, again making the assumption that what they've done is they created some sort of self service platform for that kind of procurement. Uh, but they they didn't give us the details. But replacing the entire procurement team, even if it's indirect procurement team, is pretty again pretty brave and, and pretty cutting edge. Um, another one that feels a little dystopian for me, uh, very <laughs> interesting, is that there's a, a a bank that said in four months they're going to be turning over the writing of all performance reviews to Gen AI, so managers no longer need to write those. Uh, I hope they at least get to approve them and 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 make some sort of some adjustments. Uh, I hope they're not just uh, a, you know some sort of Overwatch, um, right? But the, all four of those I thought were were pretty cutting edge in comparison to some of the things that we were we were seeing. Uh, even and even when you're thinking about these 200 companies, they're all using Gen AI. Some companies aren't even using it. These these four examples were even ahead of that curve. Right. On the next slide, Dave, we talk about, you mentioned earlier, the uh, top concerns about generative AI. It's not all, you know, hope and, and uh, promises, but there's also some concerns. What did they say? Yeah. So um, we've got uh, a year. What we did is we asked, uh, we, we came up with nine, a list of nine potential concerns of Gen AI on our own. Uh, you can see them here, cybersecurity, privacy, inaccurate information, poor quality of content, uh, bias, uh, disclosure of personal information, uh, plagiarism, uh, disclosure of intellectual property, and negative impact on jobs. And what this show, what we asked is to rank them one through nine. This shows the number of times any particular concern was ranked in the top three. We didn't wait first, second, or third, just top three answers. Um, I was actually kind of impressed that cybersecurity came number one. I don't hear a lot of discussion about cybersecurity threats to Gen AI. I hear a lot of people using Gen AI to stop cybersecurity. Um, but I'm happy because I think one of the biggest concerns I have with co-piloting um, application development is that someday someone's going to find a way to inject some malicious code into a Gen AI development copilot and uh, get that that code used uh, inside inside somebody's work. So uh, I was really pleased to see yeah. um, and 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 it's similarly with this plagiarism and copyright violations, right? Is it worry about? I'd like to think enterprises are worried about them you, themselves violating somebody's copyright, but of course they also have to worry about their own copyright and and uh, and trademark infringement um, because of an LLM. Interestingly enough, those were relatively low. Um, one of the ones that concerned me the most is that for healthcare, bias and results was actually at at near the bottom, uh, actually the very bottom, which frightens me a lot because there's been a lot of studies already in healthcare about bias uh, in AI. Uh, there's a very famous study about pain management uh, and uh, and racism uh, around bias in AI that when, when uh, that it, unfortunately that, that bias uh, in uh, healthcare moves into the LLM as well. And so if you put pain management or other kinds of healthcare uh, into an AI, instead of eliminating that bias, it confirms it. So and one that I think surprised us was the last one here. And we have another slide on that in just a second. But, you know, we've heard so much about the tremendous impact on jobs, but our survey respondents didn't have much concern about that, did they? <laughs> no, it's it was last uh, in almost every uh, uh, every way. And, and, and you see here, we, we, we asked specifically around job cuts, we said, would Gen AI lead to large job cuts, uh, small job cuts, large job increases, small job increases, or or have no impact? And you'll see what what was surprising here is that what eighty percent said that Gen AI would actually lead to job increases, 
rather than decreases. Right. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is I, I think, uh, look again, we're talking about the cutting edge, we're talking about the 200 that are already uh, implementing this technology. Uh, another is we're talking, you know, some percentage of, of these users are service providers who are sure they're going to use these as tech enabled services, they're going to add jobs. Um, but I think an, another issue is it's really important here to separate the difference between automation, intelligent automation, RPA, that kind of AI, and generative AI. Sure. Because intelligent automation, definitely you can imagine taking jobs because it's automating something a human is doing, can do it faster, more efficiently. Generative AI is at least typically now, even though we saw some examples like the procurement team being replaced, generative AI is being used far more in tandem right now to allow humans to be more creative, more uh, productive invest in what they do, um, and and more innovative. And so the perception is that the generative AI will have a higher impact on revenue growth than it will on cost cutting or at least equal. We actually asked that question, it came out almost 50-50 equal, revenue growth versus uh, cost. And so we actually didn't, we didn't bring this, the, the slide here because it's kind of a boring slide to just see 50-50. But nonetheless, it's important to remember, it's very different than other types of AI, which are generally designed to replace a person. This is designed to augment a human uh, and it makes it very exciting. Um, and, I, and I do think it will lead to, to uh some some changing in jobs uh, frank you have a you have a, a favorite story around that with uh atms right you want to yeah talk? so so uh read recently generally whenever a new technology is introduced it actually increases jobs and one of my favorites is when atms were introduced we expected that the number of bank tellers or bank employees would decrease actually if you look at the statistics and i have the chart the number of br bank branch employees actually increased. And the reason for that is that it now, with the introduction of ATMs, it made bank branches, small bank branches, more economically feasible to establish. So you ended up with more banks <laughs> and they needed to be staffed. And instead of being behind the teller window, you had, instead of having 20 tellers, now you had three and everybody else was sitting behind desks and helping customers you know, open new accounts or take out a mortgage or open a credit card and so on. So the skills changed, but it actually had a positive increase on jobs. And there's a similar story with the introduction of spreadsheets and accountants. <laughs> the number of accountants increased after spreadsheets were introduced back in the 80s. In the book that I wrote a few years ago, I looked at a lot of 100 years of automation. Yeah. Starting with UPC codes in retail, same thing. Yeah, you know, going to be reduced uh, checkout clerks. Yeah, CPG companies said, "Oh my God, we can we can have so many more varieties. Campbell's soup. We can have fifty types of soups because it's so easy to label now and stock and so on, and increase grocery uh, jobs." So there's, there's hey, Vinny, Vinny, shameless a uh, book plug. What's the name of that book where we can see those case studies? <laughs> Silicon collar, and by the way. Uh, Bank bank uh, employees and ATMs was another example in the book. Right. Okay. Silicon collar. We should all go out and, and get a copy. It's about seven years old and it doesn't have generative AI. So maybe I should update it. <laughs> but it's looking back a hundred years. So we have all those historical cases. Yes. You know, human beings tend to adopt technology at very, very different rates than us technologists uh, pr project they'll be adopted at. So that's right. Well, we're coming up on the end here, Vinny, and uh, this last uh, slide we wanted to uh, share with uh, with your audience, the other metrics that are included in the study. I'll just, Dave, I'll just go through this real quick, chime in if sure. you like. Of course, we have our, our usual uh, demographics that we report on the sample. Uh, as Dave shared, the strategic importance of generative AI, the financial objectives. This is the one we've been talking about, whether productivity or top line revenue. We found that in, in all the sectors, it pretty much is about 50-50. The different governance models and the organizational unit. Now, these are the ones we haven't gone over here during this uh, presentation, but we have the metrics around uh, generative AI spending and staffing. So we calculate uh, gen AI spending as a percentage of IT spending, uh, generative AI spending per employee uh, as a percentage of revenue, uh, the impact on jobs, 
Uh, the level of Gen A, we didn't talk about this at all today, but how much of that program is being outsourced to service providers? Mm. Um, that is very interesting results there. And then how are these projects being staffed or, or what is the staffing levels, both internal uh, and external, as well as support staff per employee? Uh, let me just tease this a little bit. Uh, the thing that Dave has been saying here is that basically the answer is what are companies spending on generative AI or staffing? It's all over the map. And the reason for that is there's a number of companies that are in pilot mode. They're doing proof of concept. And there's others that are rolling out full-scale programs. So right now, it's hard to say, based on this, how much should you be spending on generative AI? It's more as right now, it's a developing technology. And companies are in various stages of the life cycle. And then we have the areas of the adoption trends and use cases. Uh, uh, Dave has gone over a lot of that here, but again, we break this down by industry sector, and the results there are 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 quite are quite interesting. So that's uh, pretty much all we had here, uh, Vinny. And uh, you, know, you, you raised the question. Typically, you do these once a year, right? Are you getting requests that hey, this thing is moving so quickly, do it more often? Well, we, you know, right now we did it as a special survey and a special study. We're going to see what the reception is. We're going to see how the market changes. We can certainly repeat this, you know, six months or 12 months from now. And, uh, and of course, then we can see the trend, yes. how things have changed over that time period. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we may be doing that. We'll see how it plays out. You know, this is fascinating. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to put the link to the executive summary. Right. And hopefully... Many people will want to see the detailed survey. So right. thank you for doing this. And if somebody's interested in taking the survey, the next time it comes around, please let us know. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> or any of our other surveys. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and promote yourself. <laughs> All right. We will send you the link to the uh, survey application as well. Yep. Our IT spending and staffing uh, survey, our flagship survey, uh, just launched this week. So if anybody's looking to benchmark their IT spending and staffing. Uh, we'd be more than happy to have you take our survey and uh, you get some free research that comes along with that. And we'll put send that. Me link to the, the put executives. That send me yeah. a link to the executive summary of that also. I'll okay. In the blog. Yeah. Wonderful.